Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a very special video for you because it is a ranked video on the year 1986. It's going to be a this year in perfume. 1986 is a very special year in fragrances. Some of my all-time favorites, actually what I would consider my all-time or up there, it goes back and forth for me. And if you know my tastes, uh, you're going to know what the number one fragrance on this video is. There's no questions about it. Um, number two that I have to say is that I have been trying to wean myself off of caffeine lately and I honestly feel like I'm in a fog all day. Like it's been about three or four days I haven't had any caffeine and it's like my brain can't even think. So uh, if I get some extra uhs or ums, that's pretty much what it is. But um, after a week or so I know I'll feel better, but man, I drank way too much coffee on my trip to New Orleans. So this is sort of the, uh, this is the coffee come down if you will. Okay. So let's do this. This is going to be a top 14, and I've got some amazing fragrances from 1986 to show you a couple housekeeping bits first. Number one, these are fragrances from my collection, obviously. I don't own everything. So if you go in there and say, why is Mila showing Womo not in there? Or, you know, why is this fragrance from 1986 in there? The reason is I don't own it. And so these videos are just ways to highlight fragrances in my collection from the year 1986. Number two, this is according to Parfumo. So I love Parfumo. I use Parfumo regularly. It's my preferred fragrance search engine, uh, Parfumo.com. Uh, it was Parfumo.net, but they actually finally got the Parfumo.com user URL, if you will. Um, but just know that if you go to Base Notes or Fragrantica, sometimes they say different things. So I'm just going off of Parfumo to keep it uniform and even keeled across the board. But if Base Notes or Fragrantica says something different, you know, don't come back at me saying that I'm wrong because Base Notes says this and, and who knows who's right, I certainly don't know. I'm just going off of Parfumo for consistency. That's number two. Number three is, this is my ranked list. These are my, my preferences to wear. I don't think there's a bad fragrance in the lot. Actually, if you made a case and said the very last fragrance on the list that I ranked is your favorite fragrance of all time, I couldn't argue with you. It's an amazing fragrance. There are no bad fragrances on this list, I don't think. Uh, obviously they're all in my collection. I like them all. I decided to purchase them all with my own money. Uh, and so this is, uh, my preference on what I like to wear. Okay. So take that with a grain of salt. I'm not saying number one is better than number 14. I'm not saying that number two is better than number 13. I'm just saying that, uh, if I was going to rank these in preference that I like to wear, this is, uh, this is how I would rank them. And before we get started, though, we are going to do a couple of housekeeping notes. And first thing we're going to do is some major news events from 1986, a list of basically things that happened in the year 1986. Um, there's actually a pretty cool website called uh, thepeoplehistory.com. And the People History lists kind of 10 major events that happened each year. So the first thing that they list for 1986 is that uh, the Soviet nuclear reactor at Chernobyl explodes on April 26th, 1986, causing release of radioactive material across much of Europe. Uh, it's actually funny because um, if you, there's some good shows on Chernobyl if you're interested in watching it, but I think even now, you know, it's basically inhospitable. It'll be inhospitable for people for thousands and thousands of years, I think, but they, there are some animals that still live there. And, you know, there's some filmmakers that have gone and let's say they catch some fish out there or something and the fish are still just radioactive. Um, and, and so probably that's the biggest event in 1986, no doubt about it. They were saying that the, um, the neighbors, the neighboring, uh, countries actually picked it up, picked up the plume of radioactivity on their, on their monitors, uh, while Russia was still sort of trying to deny it. So that was a, that was a dark, that was a dark day. I'll tell you that, um, ter terrible tragedy, uh, but that's probably the number one, I would say, most major news event from 86. Also, second major thing in my mind that stands out is the Space Shuttle Challenger disintegrates 73 seconds after launching, killing all seven astronauts on board. Um, I've, I've seen that clip many a times, you know, being, uh, being an American, I remember watching it, uh, watching clips of that on the news in school a decade later. I mean, it was a monumental event. Um, and again, another tragedy. The Oprah Winfrey show debuts nationally. There's another tragedy. Uh, I cannot stand Oprah Winfrey. Um, but yes, her show did debut and she made herself a billionaire. Uh, Comet Haley reaches the closest point to Earth during its second visit to the solar system in the 20th century. 
the Hands Across America charity event is held. No clue what that is. Uh, the stage musical Phantom of the Opera debuts in London's West End. Soviet Union launches the Murr Space Station. That's interesting. Richard Branson on the 72-foot powerboat Virgin Challenger 2 breaks the world record for the fastest crossing of the Atlantic. Mad Cow Disease originally was uncovered. And this is a big one, too. Actually, number 10 is a big one as well, in my mind. Iran-Contra affair. So President Reagan got caught up in the Iran-Contra affair for selling arms to Iran. Okay, so... That is some major events from the year 1986. So let's do scent of the day first because um, it's going to be an Ariz Ladore week for me. Uh, there's just no getting around it. There's very few things in the fragrance world that I would say really get me hyped now. Um, you know, I see these new releases and I see that uh, this new house has a new release, that new house has a new release, and it just like washes off water off my back you know I don't even care for the most part anymore but this this is something I do care about and so on Friday the new history of Oud uh, collection is going to arrive at my front door fingers crossed according to DHL and um, I'm gonna unbox it for you guys I'm gonna do an early impression first impressions video for you guys I'm gonna do a live stream for you guys on it but to celebrate that monumental event I've been wearing some Ariz Ladore fragrances, and today, oh God, today, huh? Today I'm wearing one of my favorites of all of of all time. I think it's so underrated. It came out in 2019, and it's called Antiquity. And again, just just the detail, the attention to detail on every little thing that he does. I love the presentations. I love the um, sort of note breakdown, if you will. You can pause that and read that, but it's um. There's a lot of vintage materials in this. Peach aldehydes from the 1930s. Uh, bergamot from the 40s and 50s. Carnation from the 20s and 30s. Oud from 1975. Vintage Oud. And you know... Oh, God. I uh, did a review on this. There is... Well, I called it an early impression because what ended up happening is Russian Adam actually sent me some vials of some of these scents first to sample. Very kind of him. And I got a chance to test them and wear them as my scent of the day one day or so. And then I did a video on them. And um, this one, I basically said, imagine you're riding on like a steam engine train. Okay, like remember those old steam powered trains? Uh, they give off these big plumes of smoke into the air. And let's say you're riding on one of these old timey locomotives. Uh, they're feeding coal into the locomotive, let's say in the front. And you're sitting there and you're watching the world go by in reverse. So you're going back in time. And as you go back in time, you run into, let's say, someone like Jacques Guerlain. Sorry to my French-speaking people. Jacques Guerlain. And um, let's say you introduce him to a material called oud. Okay? Real oud. Um, not the fake crap that Tom Ford and all those other houses are feeding us, but real oud. And he decides to implement it into a creation. And this is what you get. This is antiquity. This is um, truly a trip back in time. This is um, this is refinement. This is old school perfumery. Oh God! It is um, everything about. I mean, the angelica root, which I had a chance, interestingly enough, when I was in New Orleans, we met up with a friend of my wife's who um, distills her own vodka and gin, but not for herself, not like moonshine style, but like for a restaurant. Uh, but she kind of has the know-how and long story short, beautiful machines that she has. She was showing me the machines. They're kind of one of a kind. Uh, there are some machines like it in the world, but um, each one is kind of customized to the place that it's at. So she was showing me the process and all this, and we were actually smelling things. And um, I have a postcard with the machine on it. One day I'll show you guys if you're interested. But uh, long story short is one of the ingredients used in distilling gin is angelica root. And so she pulled out the real thing. And let me smell it. And it smells a little bit like uh, green, dirty feet. Kind of weird, which I don't get that from the actual angelica root itself. But getting a chance to smell the actual thing was kind of cool. Um, you know, I don't get it when it's in a fragrance, let's say. But the actual thing is a little bit, a little bit weird. A little bit, a um, little strange smell. There's some patchouli, muscatone, Russian leather, amber, and Indian oak moss. And it is, it's so wearable. Um, 
while also having this, you know, flair, this vintage flair for the dramatic. Again, in a nutshell, imagine going back in time on a steam locomotive and meeting Jacques Guerlain, and Guerlain creates a fragrance using oud. It is, um, it's leathery, it's animalic, there's this Russian leather note in here, um, which gives off this slight sort of birch tar, Russian leatheriness in the base. Uh, it is just, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, for me, I feel like I'm wearing, um, I feel like I'm wearing one of the most special fragrances ever created. That's really what it feels like to me. I hold these type of fragrances in reserve for, you know, things like the vintage Guerlain's and stuff like that. And today wearing this, I mean, it was just, I, I wore it to work basically. And I just, you know, you feel like, um, you just, you feel like you've just been like bathed in this mythical juice. I mean, it's, it's so special to get to wear stuff like this. Cause I know there's a limited amount of it floating around out there. And you know, as I was working through the day though, I, um, I was so busy focused on my work and stuff and, uh, I didn't really get a chance to sit and smell it all day every day, but when all day today, but when I came home and I really got a chance to just kind of relax and get out of my work clothes and just put on a t-shirt, put my feet up and just pay attention to the fragrance. Oh my God. What a, uh, what a creation. So yes, it's going to be a Riz Lodore week, I think for a little bit here. Okay. So that was my scent of the day. So let's get started. Number, uh, 14 on the list. And remember, None of these are bad. Uh, this is this is an amazing fragrance. You should still hunt it down just because I'm putting it number 14. Don't let it stop you. But uh, this is a fragrance from, uh, I was going to say 1986. They're all from 1986. It's from the house of Jean-Louis Scherer. And this is called Scherer 2. Scherer 2. And you know what's funny about this fragrance is this is, I got this for $25 on Mercari. And 25 bucks. This is a floral, um, it's a floral complex Shepra is basically what it is. But there's so many little intricacies and details. And, you know, Shepras are famous for doing a lot of transitions and changing and being uh, very mossy in the base. But this also has this sort of 80s resinous side to it. So, um you know, there's some uh, Papanax that gives it this resinous quality. There's some Castorium and Civet, which make it slightly animalic and interesting to me. There's this muskiness in the dry down. There's patchouli. There's benzoin uh, in the base. But as you go up on the on the uh, fragrance pyramid, you realize that there's things like vetiver and myrrh and cedar and cinnamon. And finally, the the uh, to put a bow on everything, this actually has real Mysore sandalwood in it. And you can get this for $25. It's unbelievable. And it just goes to show, you know, what, how the hype train of things like YouTube affect fragrance prices. Because no one's out there hyping Jean-Louis Cher too. Nobody. Uh, but for people who are really into this hobby, you want something with Mysore Sandalwood. Or you want something from the old days. But you don't want to go, you know, blow your wad on one fragrance for $1,000, right? You want to get more value for your money, even if you're, uh, even if you have the money sitting there, you still want to shop smartly, right? You want to extend your dollar. Um, if you drop a dollar on the floor, you reach down and pick it up, that kind of thing, right? And that's what these type of fragrances are for me in building a collection. They are, they are staples in building a collection because this is worth. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if in a decade people are adding a zero to that price, and it's two hundred and fifty dollars now. Um, this is inter, this is, uh, Parfums International is the distributor here. There was another version that came after this Parfums International called Designer Parfums. Designer Parfums also did the perfumes for, um, for Jean Patou, for example. So, like, uh, if you pull up some of these newer Jean Patou fragrances that look like this, that looks like this, this is Sublime as an example. You'll see that uh, it says right here on the bottom, Designer Parfums. Um, and so Designer Parfums is the newer one. Parfums International is one of the older ones, but I think there's an even older one before Parfums International. Either way, um, if you can find this for a good price, 
Don't worry that it's marketed towards women. It is completely unisex. It does have some spicy floralness to it because there's also some tuberose and jasmine and rose and stuff like that. A little bit of angelica, uh, violet leaf, which adds this ozonic-like quality, which also adds an air of masculinity to it, if I may say so myself. Um, but the tuberose adds a, a hard feminine slant too. But I have no problem wearing this. I mean, I think it's right down the middle unisex. So Sharer 2, number 14. Number 13 is actually, uh, I said I bought all these with my own money, and that's actually not true because this was a gift from a, from a friend. And um, she sent me this very kindly. This used to be a cheapie in drugstores across, you know, Germany and Europe. And now it's discontinued and prices are starting to rise. But I'll tell you what, this is an amazing spicy floral fragrance with a lovely aldehydic top and kind of this Shepra backbone base, if you will. Uh, and this is called Explosive. Now, originally, okay, originally, this was called Provocation. So this went through a name change. The deep vintage of this is called Provocation. And now it's called Explosive, but now it's discontinued altogether. Came out in 1986, of course. I don't know who the perfumer for either of these first two fragrances are. Rumor is that Francois Caron had something to do with this, Share or two. I don't know if that's true or not, but, um, you know, there's a little bit of this oriental side to this too. I should mention that as well. You know how um, Poison and um, Tietro alla Scala and things like that have this sort of oriental blend with the Sheeper construction? That's what Share or two has. And Explosive, interestingly enough, um, Explosive has this dirty, floral aspect to it. So like dirty floral, imagine, but with a very posh iris. This is another one that used to be able to find for 20, 25 bucks. I have no clue what bottles are going for now that it's officially been discontinued. There's a woody element to it. There's some coriander, uh, bergamot, rose, geranium, lily of the valley, and iris with a base of patchouli, sandalwood, moss, vetiver, and ambergris. And it is just, you know, it's, it's so interesting to me that these type of fragrances could be had for $20, $25. As far as value for money goes and what is happening in the fragrance world, you know, you can't even go to Macy's and get um, just a starter designer fragrance for $25 bucks anymore. Now everything feels like it's $100, which is not how it used to be. And um, But these type of fragrances are, again, I think they're, as far as building a collection goes, if you want to build a collection and you want to do it smartly, you want to do it, um, you want to be frugal with your money, you want to extend your dollar as much as you can, uh, these type of fragrances are irreplaceable. Explosive by Etienne Eigner. Oh, fantastic. It's, um, it's so good. Okay, next on the list is going to be a... Fragrance from the house of Paco Rabanne, and this is another discontinued. So all three originally are discontinued fragrances that we're discussing. And uh, this is this could be a little expensive if you wanted to try to find a bottle. I've seen some on eBay recently for two, three hundred bucks. I don't think they're worth. I don't think this fragrance is worth that, to be honest with you. It's good, but um, it is one of my favorite sport fragrances of all time. I, I'd say top five sport fragrances of all time easily. Uh, there's a sport fragrance that I did not include in this list that would be much higher on the list, by the way. I would actually put it above uh, this fragrance we're about to talk about. It's called um, Koros Eau de Sport, I believe it was called. I, I um, did a blind testing video recently. My last blind testing video, it was actually in there. Um, and whenever I sprayed it, I was like, is this just Koros? What is this? Uh, it was Koros Eau de Sport. And um, came out in 1986. I don't have a bottle yet. I have a bottle in route. Should be here very soon. But um, Koros Eau de Sport would be higher than this one in my top five. But this would still be top five. This is called Sport de Paco Rabanne. And Sport de Paco Rabanne is a creation by Rosendu Matu, who passed away a year or so ago. May he rest in peace. Um, and... So this is a sport version of the OG, of Paco Rabanne, the OG, um, which is right here. So I prefer, believe it or not, I actually prefer the OG. Uh, however, this is a, I think this is, I mean, one of the greatest masculine fragrances of all time. But this is a great sport flanker. 
it adds just a little bit more of this, I don't know, what would you say? Um, it just adds a little bit more of this sort of um, freshness to the fragrance, if you will. There's lemon, mandarin, bergamot, petit gras, lavender. It's very sprightly in the opening. And it does feel like an 80s tennis court. Like, imagine you're, um, you're watching... Um, What's his name? What's his name? Uh, I'm thinking of the guy that won Wimbledon in the in the 80s with the high socks. Oh, what was his name? Is it Becker? Um, imagine 80s tennis. Okay, that's the image that this gives me. Still very masculine, but um, but it adds an, this extra sort of sprightliness to it. Uh, there's also still a little bit of that soapiness that you get from the original Paco Rabanne in here. There's a touch of iris and jasmine and juniper, tarragon, rose, carnation, um, oak moss, fir, cedarwood, patchouli, vetiver, musk, and leather. So for the summertime, I mean, I could wear Paco Rabanne Pour Homme in the summer. Don't get me wrong. I have no problems with it. But if you wanted to be seasonal specific, let's say, sport de Paco Rabanne still has that 80s masculine, you know, Burt Reynolds mustache. I just, um, I love these type of fragrances. They go so against the grain, so different from the stuff that they're making for men nowadays, so different from Blue de Chanel and all that good stuff. So um, as far as standing out from the crowd, you cannot go wrong with something like this in summer. Sport, de Paco Rabanne at number, what number is that? Number 12. Number 11. Number 11 is a fragrance that made a appearance yesterday on my top 10 Givenchy fragrances. Go check out that video if you haven't yet. We did a family portrait on the house of Givenchy, and this is called Zarius. Uh, this is the vintage bottle of Zarius. I love this bottle design. I think it's so classy. And this is a classy fragrance. This is basically, number 11 Zarius is basically a proper fougere for men. Uh, spicy and woody, and but it does have some floral notes in here. So there's ylang ylang, there's violet, there's Lily of the Valley, um, there's Carnation, there's Cyclamen, there's Geranium, lots of florals, but it's mixed with uh, Mace, Bergamot, Lavender, Lemon, Mandarin Orange, Cypress, which is a very underutilized note, Juniper Berries, Sandalwood, Cinnamon, Coriander, uh, Petit Grand, Tarragon, which is one of my secret notes. Anytime I see Tarragon, I, I have a good feeling about the fragrance. Uh, balsam, spruce, cedar, musk, leather, oak moss, vetiver, amber, and frankincense. And so this is compared to things like Enrico Coveri Porome. If you know those type of just classic fougeres, that's the, that's the range this falls into. Nothing extraordinary, but what it does, it does very, very well. And this is, um, I don't know what the newer bottles are like as it's still available. It went through a couple different iterations. Um, it went through one iteration that sort of looked like the bottles that they started to put Givenchy Gentleman from 1974 in with kind of the black ring around it and the black cap. And now it's in the new, more modern uh, Givenchy bottles that have this like see-through cap thing going on. And I mean, I don't know what the new formula is like, but uh, this is not a fragrance that gets hyped too much. And I can completely see why. I mean, as far as fougeres go, this is like, um, you know, you're going to maybe like a black tie event. You want to smell very clean and masculine and professional. This would be perfect for that type of an event. Uh, but it's nothing that's going to blow you away. I, I doubt very few YouTubers would smell this and go, man, this is a vintage fragrance I'm going to hype. Very few. Um, you know, if, if you like sort of the more cleaner, if you like the um, cleaner fougeres that are just easier to wear, there's still some... 80s bite in here, but it's sort of toned down, if that makes sense. It, um, it's, there, there is a little bit of leather in the dry down, which I, which I like, but, um, Zarius and number 11 by Givenchy, 1986. Okay. Number 10, number 10 is going to be a Lagerfeld. And it was hard for me to put this here because this is one of my favorite fragrances of this, um, style of this, uh, you know, what would you call this? Of this genre, I guess you could call it. And so spicy oriental fragrances. Um, if you like things like JHL by Aramis, if you like the original KL by Lagerfeld, uh, if you like even Lagerfeld Classic, I would urge you to check this out. Obsession for Men, which is coming up, um, which is coming up very soon. Uh, yes, coming up very soon, but I did not actually grab that bottle. I need to grab that. 
So if you like those type of fragrances, number 10, you should definitely try to get your nose on. This is called KL Ohm. And KL Ohm, look at the color of the juice. And it's got this um, almost like whiskey decanter bottle, right? It's absolutely gorgeous. And the fragrance is one such fragrance as well. It is a stunning fragrance, spicy oriental. It's got this, it's got this sort of orange uh, vibe that runs down the middle. Lagerfeld did that with many of his fragrances somehow. They have this orange-like feel. Uh, I think the original Lagerfeld classic has this orange, you know, line that just runs down the fragrance as well. But what they've done here that you do not get in the original KL for women from 82, what they've done here is they've added the note of rosewood. And I absolutely love the note of rosewood. Um, I've told the story before, but uh, my mother used to have these uh, rosewood rosary beads, and every Easter she would make me pray them, pray the rosary with her. And um, you know, it's uh, it's interesting how a scent can be so tied to a memory, you know. And that's one of the reasons why fragrance is such a great time machine for humans. Nothing else kind of just taps directly into our memories like smell. You smell something that you haven't smelled in decades, sometimes you are just right back to where you were 20 years ago, you know, standing there as a little kid uh, in the grocery store or wherever you smelled it, right? And 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 um, rosewood is, is one such smell for me. There's also some bergamot and lemon with cinnamon, patchouli, geranium, jasmine, rose, sandalwood, and carnation with a base of benzoin, civet, amber, musk, and vanilla. And it was very popular of these fragrances and at the time, these type of fragrances, to have a little bit of an animalic bite. And this has that. This has this civet dry down, but it's very wearable. Um, I, I would say, for oh, as far as like a winter fragrance goes, this is perfect. I mean, this is a perfect winter fragrance. So classy. Easily could wear this to work. You could easily wear this to the office. Um... The patchouli pops in this fragrance. It's just uh, just a stunner. Just a stunner of an oriental, spicy oriental fragrance. Okay, so that was number 10. Number nine. Uh, number nine is one of my... Um, one of my favorite... Actually, I will say it is my favorite from the brand. This is my favorite from the brand. And this is from the house of Gianfranco Fede. And this is called Fede for Man. Now, be careful, and you can sort of see on the back, it says Fairy Man. Uh, be careful because they did a Fairy for Men, just to confuse you. Uh, that came out in the early 2000s, I believe. And Fairy for Men is a completely different fragrance. Uh, Pierre Bourdon did it. It's a little bit of a Dior Homme style fragrance. Still very good. I've got a mini of it. I'll do a review one day for you guys. Um, but, uh, Gion, it was the, the, you could see this bottle. Sometimes it was known. So if you take a look here, you'll see Fede Man. If you take a look here, you'll see Fede Om. Okay, it says Om Man, Om Man. Um, and so it's referred to both ways sometimes in the, um, databases. So just be careful with that. But this is a spicy, leathery, but citrusy fragrance. And very few, um, fragrance houses can do this sort of Italian style citrus done well. Uh, and this is one such fragrance. I love the citrusy opening. It's a blend of three citruses, tangerine, bergamot, and lemon. And those three citruses just last and last and last. And it blends with this sort of um, spicy, uh, fizzy juniper that adds this energy to the fragrance, very energetic fragrance, but it does dry down to this old school leathery, oak mossy, fir, cedar, sandalwood, vetiver, um, you know, it is, it is just fantastic. I think this could easily be a signature scent for somebody. I got this bottle for 40 bucks. Um, the one thing I will tell you, the older bottles are known as what's called the tea bottles because this is actually see-through right here. The newer versions of this bottle, this is completely discontinued by the way, but the newer versions of this bottle, um, have have the the black right here that goes the black right here goes all the way over so it covers the whole front there is no see-through part right here um but both versions are good uh this is a splash but both versions are good and but if you can find the older tea bottle i mean that's the that's the one i'd i'd say is probably preferable 
But uh, I don't think you can go wrong with any version of this that you can find. All right, that was Gianfranco Fede, a four man from 1986. Uh, number eight, I've got to reach back and grab a couple of these because I left a few of them out. But I'm going to grab the one that I would urge you to try to find. And uh, so this is... Um, Okay, so this is actually the reason that this is even this high. If it wasn't for this version, this would have even been lower on the list, probably behind um, K.L. Ohm and Gianfranco Fede for man. But because this vintage version, which was sent to me by Armando, so thank you, Armando, um, doing right ain't got no end. And Armando has definitely put a bunch of things underneath my nose that I was oblivious to. This is one of them. So I, I originally, um, I bought a, a Coty bottle of this just to see what the new version is like. And it's absolutely shite. They should just discontinue it. They should be ashamed of themselves. Um, and then I bought, thanks to Anuj, he found me a Calvin Klein Cosmetics version, which I know is the original version of this. And, but it was the Eau de Toilette version. And I thought that was the oldest one. And I was like, okay, it's definitely better. But when I smelled this one, the original version, which says cologne spray. It's a cologne for men uh, before it went to Eau de Toilette and it has the built-in sprayer. Um, when I smelled this, this is on another level, on an absolutely on another level. Uh, I love wearing this stuff to bed. It's so, it has this, um, it has this blend of uh, musks, this 80s musks, that you'll find in, in many of these type of uh, oriental, you know, powdery, spicy fragrances. There's cinnamon and clove and lavender and myrrh. The myrrh is outstanding in here. There's a note of sage and red berries, which keeps it, sage and pine, keep it, keep it, um, those are a couple of the notes that they've added, I think, from the original Obsession that makes it lean a little bit more masculine. This smells very similar to the original Obsession for women, by the way. There's also a rosewood note in here. I mentioned rosewood here, so it was obviously a popular note to add in these type of um, compositions. And but it's all about the dry down. It's all about that ambery musk. One of the one of my favorite musk compositions from one of the big houses. Not counting Ariz Ladore and you know Bortnikov using real musk and stuff like that. But from the big houses, um, the the musk in here is. It's out of this world good. It's so vibrant and it blends with this cat-like, um, if you've ever smelled Bengal Rouge by Papillon, Papillon, Bengal Rouge Papillon captures a little bit of this vintage obsession for men. I don't even think she meant to. I think it just happened that way, but it captures a little bit of that vintage obsession for men brilliantly. And, um, so... It's musky, it's vanillic, it's ambery in the dry down. It's a little bit woody, but really the focus is on that warm, captivating musk, that powdery, furry, you know, imagine cat with the claws out musk. And it's just alluring. It's it's also very relaxing to me, but uh, the, the quality of this is on another level. If you can find this cologne spray for men, I would I would highly recommend it. Okay. So that was uh, Obsession for Men at number eight. Number seven. Number seven is, um, I think, a overlooked vintage that I, I quite frankly think deserves more love. It's, um, this competes, this is the only uh, Parfums Vial or Wheel fragrance that uh, I think can compete with uh, Ville Pour Homme, which I think is completely underrated from 1980. This is from 1986. 80 and 86, I think, are the two stars for the House of Parfums Real. Uh, and this is called Kipling. So Kipling is uh, fantastic. It's leathery. It's lavender. Imagine... Oh, it's so good. Imagine a um, very traditional... Um, you know, very traditional, leathery, spicy, masculine, green. There's green touches with artemisia, fizzy juniper, lavender, uh, lemon and bergamot with old school carnation, 
which can come across as very spicy in and of itself, but also very green. And so you got this green carnation mixing with the green pine and the basil and geranium uh, and jasmine, which geranium here slightly smells somewhat rosy, but when you blend it in with the woods and the leather and the mosses, it just creates this... Um, I, I mean, I should probably get a bigger bottle. Even though I don't need a bigger bottle, I should probably get a bigger bottle of this stuff. It is so good. Uh, I got this from uh, Le Parfumé, I believe. This is, uh, I think this is a 30 mil. Yeah, it's a 30 mil. This is a 30 mil. Um, fantastic. I love the leathery dry down. This and uh, Ville Pour Homme are my two favorites from the house. Kipling from 1986 comes in at number seven. Number six. Excuse me whilst I hydrate. Number six is number six is a fragrance that easily could be number one. Actually, it is so good. It is um, probably closest. What's closest to number six is is this. This is called Gatsby by the House of Pacoma, and I actually have a review on this. You can check it out. But uh, this actually came a year after what I'm about to what I'm about to show you. But um, the two are sisters, if you will. They are they are so close. And obviously, I think the House of uh, Pacoma, when they came out with Gatsby, took notes. And the fragrance we're talking about at number six is MCM Success. Now, one of the few fragrances I still have the boxes out. I haven't put some of the boxes up in the attic yet. And if you take a look at the bottom. Uh, you will see made in West Germany, so you can see how old this bottle is. But uh, this is a Anuj special. Thanks for finding this for me, Anuj. Uh, and I absolutely love this stuff. It is so good. I um, I turned Rich Mitch onto this, and uh, he agrees with me. I feel like uh, I feel like I've done a I've done a service. Like I've, uh, this is the type of fragrance I want to talk about on the channel. I mean, this is honestly the type of fragrance that, oh God, you know, it's like, imagine if you just took honey and just added a weight to it. Like you just added some sort of molecule to the honey that just makes it denser and heavier and thicker. And the honey just sort of just, um, you know, sometimes honey can sometimes come across as light and airy. This is not that honey. This is thick and pissy and deep and dark and heavy. This is heavy honey. Uh, and then you blend it with spices and tobacco. The, the tobacco note here blends with the honey. And obviously, I know I've mentioned Pacoma Gatsby taking notes from this, but this and Pacoma Gatsby was taking notes from Hugo Boss number no. one, which came out one year before success. Um, and, and MCM Success, this is the best fragrance from the house. It's discontinued, but, um, you can still find bottles out there because it's not being hyped. Um, and, and I think the original had this gold cap. The next iteration, I think, had a black cap, if I'm not mistaken, but I, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, I don't know how long this was in production. I have no clue. All I know is if you can find this, uh, in any form, I would I would urge you to try to get your nose on it if you're a vintage lover like I am. It's got this leathery, mossy, spicy, honey-like facet to it that is spicy and, and resinous. And you know how honey has this natural sweetness to it? That's the sweetness that you get. There's this natural sweetness to it without being sweet, without being sugar sweet. It's not sugar sweet. It's natural sweet. Um, it, it's infused with this leathery, honey-like sweetness. And um, when you add in the woods, the vetiver, carnation, lemon, bergamot, orange, and a little bit of rose with some iris, it is, uh, I mean, that's why this could easily be someone's favorite fragrance. I would not bat an eye if someone said this is their favorite fragrance. It's just boss number one gets all of the accolades for dirty honey, but this deserves it. Also, this is full bottle worthy. And I said I was going to try to find a bottle of Pacoma Gatsby, and then... Uh, all of the bottles dried up. There were only a few. And, um, you know, I, I kind of shot myself in the foot by saying how much I liked Gatsby. But if you like this style, um, if you like Hugo Boss number one, let's say, then I would highly urge you to check out MCM Success. Okay. So that is number 
six, top five, and this is one of my favorite animalic fragrances of all time. Uh, I have repeatedly talked about how much I love this stuff. Uh, and again, this is also a made in West Germany. So we have back to back made in West Germany bottles. Um, but this is called Marbert Gentleman at number five. And I have to give a special shout out to Anuj. I bought the Eau de Toilette and when it arrived, it arrived with the aftershave. Um, one of the perks from buying from someone like Anuj, you get these little, you get these little perks sometimes. Um, and so if you look right here, you'll see the made in West Germany, which I just think is so freaking cool. Uh, these older bottles. Um, Marbert Gentleman is sort of a, um, how would you describe it? It's sort of a um, fragrance that I think um, Marbert Gentleman has this, um, this sort of blend of musky, mixed with ambery and animalic, okay? So those are kind of the main accords, if you will. Musks, ambers, animalics. And um, there is some tarragon and galbanum in the opening, slightly green, but instantly what you're gonna get hit with is that musk. Uh, there's a little bit of bergamot and Amalfi lemon to kind of, you know, take you down into the fragrance, but it doesn't last long. It's overtaken by just the heaviness of a couple things. Civet, labdanum, musk and olibanum this sort of frankincense olibanum but the but the the uh, main stars of the show to my nose are musk and civet and that's why i say it's sort of a product of its time from the from the 80s it's right there with the choruses the anteuses um you know those, those type of animalic fragrances the furios if you like those type of fragrances Marbert Gentleman is a must sniff, I would say. Probably one of my favorite Marberts. I think Marbert Man is probably my favorite, but not by much. This could easily be number one on the Marbert uh, list, as far as I'm concerned. It is, and and you know, I wore this. I wore this on Halloween a couple years ago. I wore this to the office uh, a couple months ago, actually, and I loved every second of wearing it to the office. It's just like. It's like walking around with a sign, wearing this to the office is like walking around with a sign on your chest that says, fuck modern society. You know, that's exactly what it's like. It's like, it's like pulling up in a, in a horse and buggy. It's just badass. I absolutely love this stuff. I, I love, I love, I love wearing it for myself, but this is one of those fragrances that I almost love wearing just to see the reaction of other people. You know, it is an outrageous fragrance. That is, you know, for fragrance lovers, it's, you can't get much better than this. It's so refined. They call it refreshing, so refined. Um, and I think fragrances need a little bit of that animalic touch to keep them interesting. You know, some people might be surprised why you would add civet or castorium or hyrax or something like that to a fragrance composition, but uh, they just, they keep the fragrance, they keep the fragrance interesting to me. Uh, and, and so if you can find those older bottles of Marbert Gentleman, I, I would highly urge you to try to get your nose on it. There's a little bit of this honeyed aspect too. And I was mentioning some of the honeyed like characteristics of stuff like this, not, not as much as success. And you can almost see the color of this deep, you know, ambery, um, liqueur like juice color. And so it's not as much, the honey, the honeyed aspect is not as much, uh, but even things like Koros had a little bit of a honeyed aspect, right? So it's more like the honey that you would find in Koros, the way that it's not the main player, but there is a little bit of this weird honeyed aspect that you'll find, even though there's no honey note listed in the note listing. Okay, so that's number five, Marbert Gentleman. Number four, number four is one of my favorite Feminine targeted fragrances of all time. It's very hard to put this at number four, but I had to. Um, one of my favorite feminine targeted fragrances ever. I've got like four bottles of this stuff. I never want to be without it. It's called Teatro a la Scala. And go watch my, I have two videos of Teatro a la Scala on the channel. I have uh, one that is uh, my early impression, my, my first impression video of this, if you will. And you can go watch me just Eyes roll in the back of my head, ooh and ah and drool all over this, how good it is. This will knock you out of your chair. It's so good. God. 
Oh, everything about it. It's just one of my favorite feminine targeted fragrances of all time. Um, and then I have a comparison video between the EDT and the EDP. I think I prefer the EDT a little bit, but honestly, the EDP is, is equally nice. You could go, it doesn't matter which one you get. Just, they're discontinued. Um, and this is aldehydes, coriander, fruity notes, and bergamot on the top. Beeswax, again, the honeyed aspect, which I love the honeyed, the way that these 80s fragrances used honey and animalics. 100% to my liking. They're, they really speak to my heart. Beeswax, geranium, carnation, jasmine, orris root, rose, tuberose, and ylang ylang, civet, oak moss, vetiver, benzoin, frankincense, musk, and patchouli. And if you want a fragrance that, um, if you want to smell a old school, proper oriental style shepra, which sounds like, you know, a clash of, of, uh, fragrance categories, but these type of fragrances are, they really speak to my heart. And so it's a cheaper fragrance, but it has this oriental sort of honeyed, you know, resinous feel underneath, right? Um, and if you want to smell a fragrance that uses civet almost like a reference, this is a, this is a reference Shepra with civet in the base. This is exactly how it should be done. Tietro Alaska, I would love to know who the perfumer is. If anyone knows, do let me know. I think it's probably somebody big that just didn't want to be listed. I think it's probably someone like Dominique Ropion. I would not be surprised if that's a Dominique Ropion or, you know, some, some, someone big time. Um, that's just my guess. Okay. So that was number four, number three. And, um, Number three and number two have some history with each other, and it's and number two you might think is a little bit of a cheat, but it's really not because this is the year that this version was released, so it's not a cheat at all. Uh, but the original goes back decades and decades uh, to the to the twenties for number two. But number three is a fragrance that was done by Michel Almarac, and and there's a beautiful article on Fragrantica on this fragrance. The fragrance is called Davidoff's Zeno. And if you can find one of these older Lancaster bottles, that's what I would urge you to go for. Although I do hear the new stuff is quite good. There are some differences. So, so um, with Zeno, there's an article on Fragrantica and you know what's funny is whenever I'm holding this, all I can smell is antiquity on my hand. It's so good. Uh, so Zeno, by Davidoff, there's an article on Fragrantica about how Michelle Almarac and the creators of Zeno wanted to use the base of Shalimar, that um, that Shalimar base, that gar that Guerlainade, the vanilla, the, the Guerlainade, that uh, that ambery vanilla, a little bit of jasmine, that that Guerlainade top secret, you know, DNA. They wanted to kind of use that Shalimar base and create sort of this masculine, um, woody, some would say even barbershop-like fragrance on top of it. And that's exactly what they did. They created an unbelievable, I guess you could call it an amber fougere. I don't know what you would call this style, but this is one of my favorite masculine styles in perfumery. It really started with Zeno and it went on until things like Escada Porom and Guerlain's Heritage. Uh, but it's interesting that Zeno came out first and then Guerlain kind of made their own take on it. Um, it's That's very interesting to me. And I don't see many people making that connection, but uh, there's definitely a connection to me. To me, there definitely is. So Zeno is rosewood. Again, rosewood's a popular note in 1986. Lavender, bergamot, clary sage. And there is an article that says that Zeno actually is what uh, Tom Ford's Beau de Jour was based off of. I, uh, I said that in a previous video. Someone came back and said, nope, that's not true. And then someone responded to him and said, yep, it is. Here's the article proving it. Um, so, so Tom Ford has basically said that Zeno inspired Beau de Jour, uh, with some geranium, rose, jasmine, and lily of the valley in the heart and the base of patchouli, sandalwood, cedar, amber, tonka bean, and vanilla. And I am just so at home in these type of fragrances. There's something about this. And then the very next year, Eigner put out a fragrance called Free Life, I believe it was called, uh, that you'll see in the 1987 video we're going to do. That is fantastic. I'm so glad I found what I found because it's hard to find that fragrance. But 
you know, th this started a little bit of a revolution um, in, in masculine perfumery where you do get some of that vanilla in the base, that tonka bean, um, and it's just, I just feel so at home with this. The, the patchouli is the star of the show. There's a fragrance put out by the House of Bois 1920 called Extreme, which is very close to this, but the patchouli is even more amped up and extreme to me. I prefer Zeno. Um, I, I just, these type of fragrances are, are like coming home to me. They are, uh, I just feel so comfortable, you know, like being in a pair of shoes that just fits perfect or a suit that's just tailored to your body. That's Zeno for me. And the rose note in this, huh? The rose note is just, I mean, it just, um, it just sort of creeps in, like, very similar to the way that the rose um, sort of creeps in in, in Antaeus to me. Or, um, you know, if you've ever smelled the way that the rose creeps in in, in, in Ungaro's Pour Lome 3 by, um, by uh, Francois de Marchi, and Jacques Poles created those, created those Ungaro, that trio of Ungaro masculine fragrances. Um, just amazing stuff. This is um, way, this punches way above its weight class. The fact that I was able to get two of these uh, 75 mil bottles for 60 bucks a couple years ago. I mean, and I've got a third little smaller one as well. So I'm well stocked on Zeno. I never want to be without this. This is one of my forever fragrances. Earthy, Oriental. That patchouli and rosewood, mm. and then that Guerlainade, you know, DNA base. Speaking of Shalimar, it's a great segue because the number two fragrance actually is Shalimar. It is Shalimar Eau de Parfum. And I have a refill, so sorry the bottle doesn't look cool, but um, there you go. When you care about the juice and you don't care about the bottle, you know, who cares? But, um, and you may say, wait a minute, Shalimar came out in 1925. Uh... Well, yes, but this Shalimar, uh, the Eau de Parfum, actually was first released by Guerlain in 1986, believe it or not. So the original Eau de Toilette and the, and the X-Tray came out in 1925, and you see how many decades and decades it took them to put out the Eau de Parfum. So the Eau de Parfum, according to Parfumo, first came out in 1986. And the Eau de Parfum is actually my favorite um, version of Shalimar, if you will. Well, that's not true. The, the Parfum de Toilette is my favorite version. That's what Guerlain called the Eau de Parfum before it was customary to call stuff Eau de Parfum. Um, and this is... I mean, I know I said Teatro a la Scala is one of my favorite feminine targeted fragrances, and there's a lot of truth to that. This may be my favorite feminine targeted fragrance. I think Shalimar just um, encompasses, for me, it's not, it's the first fragrance that opened my eyes to feminine perfumery, first of all. Um, it's, it's the fragrance that uh, sort of opened that doorway for me to be able to wear and be comfortable wearing perfumes that are targeted for women. You know, like uh, to the office a couple days ago, I wore Guerlain's Metallica or Metalis as it, they had to change the name to after the brand, after the band sued the brand of, of Guerlain for using the name Metallica. Um, but, uh, and that's a feminine targeted fragrance. I wore it to the office and had no issues at all with it. And similar with something like Shalimar, there is this, There is this perfect um, opening of bergamot. You get a lot of bergamot oil in the top. It's like 30% uh, of the formula or something I read. Lots of this tart bergamot with this beautiful floral heart, Irish jasmine and rose with these other blossoms mixed in with vanilla, balsamic notes, and tonka bean in the base. And there's something dirty about it. And yet, you know, it's almost like... Um, it's almost like, imagine two bodies after making love and you're just, you know, coated in sweat, right? There's this, um, there, there's this, uh, there's this warmth to this fragrance. That, there's something about the fragrance that adds this beautiful warmth that I just absolutely love. It's, it's my favorite vanilla fragrance of all time, hands down. No, it's, it's not even a question. Not even a question for me. Shalimar is, um, 
is is my favorite vanilla fragrance and the way that that orris that iris butter just sort of uh i mean it's um it is um it's it's unmistakable i mean you you can't smell this and think you're smelling anything else it is like uh you know how when you see a bmw with that double grill in the front it's unmistakable to BMW. That's like Shalimar. You smell Shalimar. There's nothing that smells like Shalimar to me. It is, uh, it is so um, focused on its on its mission. It's just piercing, and it's and it's so there's there's so much memory and history with Shalimar. The story about um, the emperor, the Mu the Mughal emperor Shah Jahan. And, you know, building the Taj Mahal for his uh, beloved wife who died in childbirth and the symbolism of that, the grandness of the Orient. I mean, all of it, all of it factored into this one fragrance for me, Shalimar. Uh, just fantastic stuff. And the fact that it that is not number one just goes to show you how much I love number one. But if you know me, you know there's no way there's anything else number one except for this. And uh, this is the great... Uh, probably one of the greatest leather fragrances of all time. This is Bellamy. And Hermes Bellamy. So this is the original shaker bottle. And then this is the very first reformulation. And they are both... I would take either of these. Don't, don't quabble over... Don't pay more because the original shaker um, versus the first reformulation. I would just get either of these if you can. I would not go for the new one though. Um, the new one with the black cap, I would probably urge you to go for uh, Bellamy Vetiver over that if you can find it. Um, but this is, my God, man. Oh, I, I'm going to spray this. Man, I, I can't smell this without wanting to spray it. It is off. Oh. So in the opening, you're going to get a lot of spices. I think you're going to get some spices not listed as well. There's sage. There might be a touch of cumin, a little bit of mandarin orange, bergamot, and lemon. And the fact that there's a little bit of cumin in the opening doesn't surprise me because you have to remember, this is uh, Hermes we're talking about. They are big on history. And what came first? Eau de Hermes with that big, you know, almost red hot, mixture of, of cumin and cinnamon and, and animalic leather. But this just instantly kind of takes a sharp right turn and you're going to start to get more of the woods. You're going to get a beautiful cedar note. And the cedar, the cedar mixes with this very masculine sage, keeps it very dry, almost like the wood is so dry it's ready to catch fire, you know. Almost like there is a slight hit of frankincense in here. There, there isn't any listed, but it's almost like that. Like the wood is just ready to just go up tinder style. Uh, carnation, basil, jasmine, orris root, and patchouli in the heart. And again, this combination of leather and orris is a killer combination for me. There's a little bit of this waxy styrax in the base with... Um, textured oak moss. The oak moss is like walking into a, a tree and just feeling the inside of the tree. You know, hollowed out tree with oak moss growing all around it. Um, it's vetiver, castorium, and vanilla in the base. But that leather, orris, with those spices, that classic Hermes spicy opening. Oh, man, I'll tell you what. It's like being in heaven. This is a this is a signature scent for me. Easily a signature scent. I would have no problem. Absolutely no problem wearing this every day. This could easily be Ram signature scent. It is so me. It's 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 professional, it's classy, but it has this it has this raw side to it. You know, it has this um There is this get the fuck out of my way uh feeling with Bellamy. You know, it's very professional. Rich Mitch says it's very English to him, very Sherlock Holmes. Imagine being properly dressed with a top hat and, you know, you're you're going out and you're trying to solve a big mystery. You're going about your life trying to solve the mystery of life, right? That is, uh, that's Bellamy. 
but being but being with friends of course because bellamy means beautiful friend um and so you're you're you have your friends with you you have your 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 crew man i love bellamy it is um it is one of my forever fragrances and uh, has to be number one on the 1986 countdown. So we're at an hour. Thank you very much for watching, everybody. Don't forget to like the video before you leave. It does help. I hate saying that shit, but as a YouTuber, I guess I, guess I should. So um, like the video, subscribe, always help subscribing, liking, commenting, all the stuff that helps the, the algorithm. Uh, it's very much appreciated. We're constantly getting more and more people coming to the channel. Uh, I love doing these videos for you guys. I uh, can't wait to get over my caffeine, um, you know, my uh, my ca addiction to caffeine after going on that trip. I need to break this cycle so I get the fog, knock the fog out of my brain so I can get back to feeling like myself again. So probably a couple more days. Definitely by the time the um, History of Oud collection arrives on Friday, I should be back to my 100% self. So uh, thanks everyone for watching. Do let me know what your favorite is from the list. Uh, let me know if there's any from 1986 that I do not have in the list that you love. And I'll hopefully catch you next time. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.